Welcome to the discussion on thyroid pathologies and today we will be discussing Graves disease, a form of thyrotoxicosis and we have discussed two forms of thyrotoxicosis in our previous discussions, the multinodular thyrotoxic goiter and a solitary thyrotoxicosis and in both we uh, discuss there are only two principles to remember in the management, number one to get everybody controlled medically, get the mu thyroid. And then the nodular goiters, they need some form of ablation. Either surgery for the large goiters, or if the goiter is small, you can consider for radioiodine ablation. And if it's a multinodular goiter, the surgery will be a total thyroidectomy. If it's a solitary nodule, it's obvious it could do only a lobectomy. So we'll see what to do with Graves' disease. This 40-year-old lady came with a enlargement, complaining of neck enlargement. And also she said she's losing weight during the couple of few months, two to three months, she's losing weight. So it was fairly obvious that it's a goiter, but of course as a first step he has to swallow and then it moved upwards. Then inquiry into the functional status, she was losing weight. She had complained of excessive sweating and she was feeling uh, anxious and also uh, heat intolerant. She was feeling that it's very warm now. And also direct inquiry, she said she finds a tremor in the hand and it's sometimes a bit socially embarrassing for her. So clinically, uh, symptom-wise, it's thyrotoxicosis, but now we have to examine and confirm two things. One thing is confirm the thyrotoxicosis by looking for physical signs and also to look what type of goiter this is. So examination of the neck, it, it showed that the enlargement is a diffuse enlargement involving both bones. And also swallowing could just get below the lump, but for confirmation, uh, we did the percussion, you know, then it uh, reconfirmed. And the pulse rate was 130 beats per minute. The hands were actually uh, very, uh, there's a lot of sweating. Uh, and also the, she demonstrated a tremor. Looking for a buoy, there was a buoy in, uh, towards the upper pole of the neck. And then, so clinically, this fits a more into a, uh, into a Graves disease. And Graves disease, disease, it's usually due to, it's an autoimmune disease due to uh, certain antibodies. Uh, and then, because of this antibody stimulation will occur, even on the gland, most of the graves are, they have a diffuse enlargement. But very rarely, very rarely you may find people with graves where there are antibodies when you test, but the gland is slightly multinodular or some people even have uh, dominance on one side. But this lady, it's a, uh, it's a diffuse goiter with thyrotoxicosis, likely to be, uh, and also having this brewy. It's also mostly it's seen in graves. So the eye signs are more often positive in the graves. So we looked into these. So these are the things that we have to look for. And lid retraction. Now, this is the normal appearance of a person where your upper limbus of the iris is not seen because the upper, upper eyelid covers it. So only part of the iris is seen and also obviously therefore no sclera is seen there. But in lid retraction, the lid retracts upwards and your upper limbus of the iris is visible and if it's retracted more, you can even see part of the sclera. So this is not exophthalmus, this is only lid retraction. In ephthalmus, 
Now, in the normal person, look at this. The lower eyelid, it covers just along the lower limbs. Actually, the lower part of the iris is completely seen. The lower ball is just there. Exophthalmus, in the exophthalmus, the early phase, what you see is you start seeing the sclera below. That is, now in the normal person, we saw that the lower limbus is just there, but you don't see any, any sclera. But in the exophthalmus, in the early phase, you will start seeing the sclera there. And later, when it is getting more, even top part, you start seeing sclera. So this is a combination of lid retraction and a exophthalmus. Now some people you may just have exophthalmus only. In that case, your upper lid should be there. Should be there, but if there's a so that is there's only exophthalmus if your upper lid is there. But if your upper lid also moves upwards, it is exophthalmus plus a lid retraction. When it gets more exophthalmus both combine, you can get this appearance. Now look at this carefully. Now this is not exophthalmus. Yeah, you can't see any sclera below. But your upper limbus of the iris is exposed. So it's a lid retraction. Now if, if it retract more, you will start seeing sclera above also. But until you see sclera below, you are not going to label it as exophthalmus. So the easiest way, look at the lower part. If there are sclera exposed, okay, that's exophthalmus. And look at the upper eyelid. If it is beyond your uh, upper border of the, or at least at, at the upper border of the uh, iris, or even little more, there is lid retraction also. So here it's a combination of lid retraction and exophthalmus. Just rehearse this couple of times, and then you will be able to get in uh, understand this better. The two terms, and then the eye movements. One thing is with a lid retraction. When you when you get the person to follow your finger down to look down, your eyeball will move down, and in a normal person, the upper lid also follows the eyeball. But in a case of lid lag, the eyelid it 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 stays a little behind. It won't move as the eyeball move moves down. So this the lady we are discussing. See, she had a lid retraction and also some form of lid lag, but there was no exophthalmus. And then also you check the other eye movements and the worst affected muscles in uh, this, uh, especially graves, are the sup uh, the superior rectus and the inferior oblique. So the most affected movement is looking upwards and outwards. And this person that was present. So to summarize, we have got a patient who clinically fits into graves with a diffuse enlargement of the gland, symptoms of paradoxicosis and physical signs confirming a tachycardia, tremor, a bruit and also a lid uh, retraction and a lid lag. So we have to confirm. So that's the clinical picture. So we have to confirm and it's very straightforward. We did the full profile, both T4, T3 elevated and a TSHO very low. An ultrasound confirmed that it's a diffuse enlargement. And of course, to say it's graves, with certainty, you have to do the antibody tests. So that is necessary. Uh, and so I can do at the, say, the antibody, you can read the various, there are various uh, antibody tests that you can do. And then, FNAC in the graves there is no indication because it's a diffuse enlargement and graves is not a pre malignant condition so FNAC has no indication so then once confirmed how do you manage and as I discussed earlier there are two steps in the management everybody should undergo medical management and then consider whether ablation is necessary and we discussed in the nodular goiters, multinodular and solitary, ablation is essential. 
either by surgery for large glands or by ablation if the gland is small. But the graves, there's a chance that it may go into a permanent remission with medical management only. So the answer you get with time, you treat and see the response. And if it's responding, of course, you can get a medical uh, remission. And then you withdraw, stop the drugs and they will be in a remission. So anyway, we started this patient on the antithyroid medication. Carbazole and also propranolol until she got us uh, for about four to six weeks to get a for the, for the initial symptom, uh, symptomatic benefit, we have discussed this before because your th secreted thyroxine levels has a half-life and also there's a protein-bound fraction. So until the elevated thyroxine already what are in the circulation, it settles down, we provide the symptomatic control with propranolol. But then after that, once the carbonosol starts action, uh, then after six weeks, it is not necessary to continue. So clinic review again she was happy she gaining weight could sleep well no excessive sweating no tremor and the thyroid functions she uh, was on a dose of carbamazole 10 milligrams TD uh, three times and we started according to the T24 levels and the thyroid functions uh, they have come to normal level so what are we going to do now now this one, I said, so you have a chance of a medical remission. So you can continue the treatment. Generally, when you continue for 18 to 24 months, you can just see that they are going into a medical remission. So how can you know? Now, so, so this patient, again, you can review the patient. Uh, of course, monthly, you, you may have to uh, get down to the clinic for the prescribed drugs. But then, of course, you do a clinical assessment. Uh, thyroid functions, of course, you can do every month, but of course, if you see that patient is uh, the weight is now stable, pulse rates are in the normal range, you can even do maybe after three months, there's no problem once the patient is settled. But in the first two uh, times, four to six weeks uh, assessments may be necessary. So, in the follow up, what we noted is that the thyroid functions they came down to the normal range. The carbus that it was but it stayed there. So now we can't reduce the carbosol dose in this situation. Because if we stop, because it's a 20 days with a high dose, if you stop it will go up. So we were coming to about 18 months. So she was still needing a bit of a high dose of carbosol. And also this gland is bit big one. So it needs some volume reduction also. And then the patient was also happy to undergo surgery. So we offered, because it's a diffuse both lobes enlargement, obviously you have to do a total thyroidectomy. So again, it's very important the patient has to be euthyroid. So a couple of days prior, we did the thyroid functions. They were within the normal range. And did a total thyroidectomy. And as I discussed earlier, stop the carbonosol after surgery. And uh, so you have to start on thyroxine. Uh, because she was undergoing a total thyroidectomy. But then, of course, the other alternatives. Now, there are some people who start on treatment, but with time, you are just forced to keep on reducing the dose. So, these are the people who you can predict they will go into a, uh, into a medical remission. Some people, you may not have even to go can continue for 18 months. Even before that, quick response, you, you are forced to stop because you, you see that each time, the TH thyroxine levels are coming down, you reduce the dose and reduce the dose like that, you are just forced to stop. So that's the best proof that you, you are forced to stop, you are 100% sure. So then you stop and then you follow up the patient. If the patient stays in a complete remission, it's perfect. It can happen in some people. Uh, and then uh, there's a the small subset who may relapse, who may relapse in that case, you start on treatment again. You start on treatment again and you can discuss with the patient. And then, of course, you can offer some form of ablation therapy. Now, the therapy we discuss in this, 
the earlier patient was a total thyroidectomy because it is a bit of a large gland. But if the gland is not very big, the other form of ablation possible is radioidine ablation. Now, uh, there was a time in the past people were worried to get radio ablation because they are this grades a bit of a younger people, but now it's shown that there's no problem. So we can discuss this, but with a large gland again, it will be surgery, but a small gland, you can do radio ablation. So this uh, ablation will be necessary only if you think the, gray, the that you have to keep on the medication at a higher dose. Or in the people who go into a remission, you have stopped the treatment, but who get a relapse. So you restart treatment and consider ablation. Uh, but there may be a, a subset where uh, they go into a remission and they are in a remission. Perfect, no problem, but we have to follow them up. So in Graves' disease, to sum up, majority, it's a diffuse enlargement, and you have symptoms and signs of thyrotoxicosis, and the, ch the chance of, of uh, getting a, a brewy positive or the eye signs positive higher with Graves, but your confirmation is dependent on your thyroid functions and the ultrasound scan. Also, antibody assessment will confirm it's a graves. And you treat medically, get them under control. And if they have a good response with reducing doses, you can stop after 18 months. Or some people, you may have to stop even before they have a very quick response. And they respond, then you follow up and see if they have permanent remission, perfect. If they relapse, Restart treatment, consider ablation by a total thyroidectomy or radioidine ablation. And there may be few people, like the patient we are discussing today with a bit of a larger goiter, who are not responding. You need a bit of a high dose continuously and uh, you straight away decide on ablation. But most of the graves, they generally should try to go into a medical remission. So it's better to keep in mind without embarking on surgery, without a proper uh, decision taking, without proper evaluation. So these are the three forms of therapy graves. A majority you can go into a medical remission and follow up. Few who relapse, of course, restart treatment and ablation, but few, my, few a little subset, you may decide on ablation at the beginning.